So hello everyone um, here on uh, site, if you will, and also to everyone who is here virtually. We're very happy to have you at this ESMT Open Lecture with Francis de Viracour. He's a professor of management science here at ESMT, and he's the director of the Center for Decisions, Models, and Data at ESMT Berlin. It's always really exciting for us to have one of our own at an ESMT Open Lecture, and this one is a part of the um, Berlin Science Week. So we hope if this is your first time at ESMT that you enjoy it, but I see a lot of, um, uh, let's say, old faces here, for example, and I'm glad to have you back on campus. Um, not, not old, like people I know from long ago. So um, anyway, just to let you know that we will have a chance for question and answers. I told everyone on, uh, he, on site how it works, but if you are joining us virtually, please know that you also can um, ask questions in the Q&A section and I will be sending them on to the moderator. So to tell you a little bit more about Francis, then he is the first holder of the president's chair at ESMT. And um, he's won the best teacher award at ESMT. I think, I don't know, it's more times than I have fingers. I can't count how many times, but he has like a stack of awards in his office. So he's not, so he hasn't put them all up on the wall because he probably wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to see the wallpaper anymore. His research interests lie in the area of decisions, which makes sense, so decision science, analytics, and operations. He's the author of numerous academic um, journal articles, and he is also the author of Framers, Human Advantage in an Age of Technology and Turmoil, which he wrote with his co-authors, uh, Victor Meyer Schoenberger and um, uh, Kirkier, Kirk, yeah, yeah, Kirkier, Ken Kirkier, Ken Kirkier, sorry, Ken. My apologies. So this evening, Francis will share with us more about his findings and his co-author's findings around framing and how we can use framing to make better decisions. So our lecture today will be moderated by Thomas Ranger. He is the nonfiction non book author and keynote speaker. So he writes for um, such magazines as Brand Eins and The Economist. And um, Thomas also works at this connection between technology and business and the intersection between technology and technology's consequences for society and policy making. So they have worked together a little bit. I think they um, agree on some things and disagree on others. So it should be pretty interesting. But um, before I talk too long, I probably already have, I'll turn it over to Francis. Francis, the floor is yours. Wow, thank you. Uh, thanks for the kind words and thanks for organizing uh, this event, uh, Molly. Thanks, Thomas, for being here. It's true that last time we talked was two years ago. It was pre-COVID times. It sounds like ages ago. And we were talking about AI and humans in the age of human decision making, in the age of artificial intelligence. So um, indeed, this is a book that I co-wrote with uh, two friends of mine. Ken is a, a journalist at The Economist and Victor He's a um, professor at Oxford, also in the UK. Um, before I start, it's, uh, it's very nice because I recognize a lot of very old, sorry, guys, faces. Some of my first students, I believe, at SMT almost. Um, and then uh, many new faces. So it's very humbling to see that uh, so many people want to learn more about the power of framing in an age of uh, artificial intelligence. So this book um, is about our ability um, to change perspectives. It's about our ability to represent situations in a way that help us maybe decide better. And we can have different representation, we can elicit different perspective because fundamentally we human beings think in frames. We develop representation of the world, mental models that enable us to um, do what we call counterfactuals to generate perspectives. And one of the main theme of the book, there are several, but the central uh, theme of the book is the idea that his ability to represent, his ability to frame is what really makes us different from animals to a large extent, but most important for us to the way AI decides, the way the machine decides. And so this is what I'm going to try to walk you through. Uh, I'm not going to try to be too boring. I'll try to speak for 20 minutes because I'm really looking forward to engage with, with Thomas and, and all of you. Um, it's not about me, it's about, it's about you. You'll see, I hope I'll convince you of that. So let me backtrack a little bit. Let me go to a world that we have forgotten two years ago in 2019 before COVID existed or was discovered. In fact, the WHO, the World Health Organization published a very scary report what they found out or what they predicted is by 
2050, 30 years from now, there will be more than um, 10 million deaths, sorry, I forgot an S here, 10 million deaths um, due to uh, drug resistant diseases. So what's going on here that um, or antibiotics over the years have been less and less efficient at killing bacteria because bacteria have developed resistance. And so what it means is that in 30 years from now, we'd go back to the middle age. You, you or your children or your grandchildren may die from an infected wounds um, as it happens in fact to the, to the son of the US president in the twenties. Uh, COVID will look like a walk in the park. It's like, you know, we had many deaths, unfortunately, over the past two years, um, but 10 million per death is another dimensions. Now, it's not that obese brands have not tried to solve that problems, but uh, the issue is that for the past three decades, there has been no single, really no single new antibiotics, okay? It's not that we didn't try, maybe we could have tried harder, but obese brands tried their best and it's, it's a sounding zero. Um, last night I was, I was preparing this talk and I had my oldest daughter, Naomi, who was looking at it and she told me, wow, this is scary. And I said, yes, this is scary and it's going to be more problem for you than for me, unfortunately. I, I would prefer to die than you to die, but um, be ready for this. No, it's not quite true. I mean, there's a bit of hope. Last year, just before COVID hit us, CD0 may have become a one. There has been a new antibiotics, which is called halicin, that has been proposed. So it has not been tested, you know, there's no, um, again, uh, trials yet, but at least they found a new antibiotic that can kill 35 powerful bacteria. And more important for us, it leverage a totally new mechanisms to kill those bacteria. But what it does in a nutshell is that it basically shut down the ability of the bacteria to process energy. It's like turning off the engine and then the bacteria dies basically. But here's the thing, uh, here's the catch. Halicin, which is our best hope to tackle thus far, maybe there will be others, but to tackle these issues, our best hope is not coming from a human brain. Halicin has been discovered by a machine. And there's a hint in the name. I mean, I have a tip for you. Each time you see Hal in a name, you know that chances are there is a machine behind it because Hal was an artificial intelligence um, entity in a movie long time ago called 2001 a Space Odyssey. And in that movie, I hope it's not a metaphor for what is waiting for us, but in that movie, the machine kills all humans because basically they become useless. Okay, the machine knows better and the humans are on their way. Okay, so I hope it's not true. I don't believe it's going to happen quite, but for sure last year, this is the headlines of uh, the Financial Times, AI discover antibiotics to treat drug resistant diseases. And you know, I mean, if you look at the news, this is not the only field healthcare where you see progress um, of AI. I mean, of course, there's a lot of hype. I believe there's a lot of hype around AI, but surely you see slowly, but surely AI taking over more and more of our decisions and sometimes being more creative than we are. And this led some people, mostly in the US, but, but all, also a lot in, um, in Europe. Um, in the book, we call them the hyper-realist, the hyper-realist. Um, but, but they may have a point, basically, where they say that if we want to tackle our most pressing issues, we may want to turn to the machine. They make better decisions than we do. And again, they can be more creative than we are. And they may have a point. I mean, if you have paid attention and I read the books, the bestsellers and read maybe the research on decision sciences for the past 20, 30 years, what you would have learned is that yes, our brain is biased. We are subject to decision biases. We are overconfident, we confirm, et cetera, et cetera. We suck at making decisions, quite frankly. And then if you read very recently, you must have learned all the research about the fact that there's a lot of noises in our decisions. We are not consistent. Okay, so maybe those people have a point. You may want to rely on a machine who are much more accurate and much more consistent than we are. Now, of course, and that's why we wrote the book, we strongly disagree with that statement. I mean, of, I strongly believe, I mean, I, and I teach that every day that we are subject to these decision biases, but this is really looking at the, at the dark side of human decision-making. There is a bright side. And the bright side is that we all have a superpower his superpower is his ability to develop our own representation of the world, our own models, what we call frames or mental models, in a way that machine can't. 
And if you pay attention, if you look beyond what AI is doing, you will always find human framing, in fact, at stake. If you go back to this example, if you go beyond what the machine does, you look at the people and you will meet um, Regina Barzili, who is a researcher at MIT and her team who developed the machine. But before being able to develop the machine, they had to reframe and represent the problems. So I'm going to skip the technical details, but in a sense, what they did is that instead of trying to represent the problem of developing an antibiotics by finding the right structure in the molecule, they shift their attentions not to the structure, but to the properties of molecules. I mean, I'm simplifying a lot, but this is his reframing from structure to functionalities. And because they looked at the functionality, then they can develop the AI system that discover for them a new uh, drug. So the point is that if you claim that AI discover Halicin is the same as claiming that it's not Robert Koch who discover uh, uh, microbes or a bacteria, it's the micro, uh, microscope that discover the micro, uh, microbe, sorry. Okay, so it's the same behind it, there is a framing act. There is someone who had to properly frame and represent a reality that they could not directly perhaps observe. So what, what is framing in the end? I'm using framing, I'm using frames, I'm using representations. Um, this is indeed is quite conceptual. So what I want to do is to make sure I give you an intuition because we use that every day in our daily life and intuitions about how framing works. Okay, and to state the same, and, and also why and what make them so powerful. So to state the stage, and I, I, I love to do that. I do that with my, my students and with my executive participants all the time, it's always fun, but I'm going to try to do it with you. I want you to look at this picture and I want you to decide for yourself how many triangles do you think there are in these pictures? Okay, so this is simple data. I hope you don't find it controversial. I'm not talking about Brexit. I'm not talking about Donald Trump, et cetera. It's just, it's just data, pixel on the world. How many triangles do you think? Anybody wants to give it a try? Or are you shy? Zero, six, six. Who says more than six? How, how many? Eight? More than eight? Yeah. 11. And less than six, I, I heard. Less than six, less than five? Some people said zero, no? Did, did someone say zero? Yeah, thank you very much. No, what's going on here? I show you the same data. Same uncontroversial data, and I'm from zero to 11. I, I hate to break the news to you guys, but data per se is totally useless. And you're not the only one. I mean, I asked these questions to a bunch of executives, CEOs, 60 people, CEOs, and you see that in this group, if you look at the left-hand side, you have 14% of that group who told me zero, indeed. In the same group, you had people who tell me 11. Same data, totally a huge variety of answers. And what's going on here? Again, let me say it and let me break the news to you, data per se is totally useless. People gave me or give different answer because in the end, they have represented the problem differently. They frame my questions differently. People who give me zero, they are nerds like me. Okay, they use a mathematical frame to answer that questions. And for them, a triangle is three straight lines. And I'm sorry, when I look at these pictures, I do not see three straight lines, so it's zero. If you give me 11, you have framed the problem totally differently. For you, each time you can fit somewhere a triangle, it counts as one. And some people can count 11 triangles here. So there's no right and wrong answer. It's just to show you that the most important step when you try to solve a problem, when you try to innovate, when you try to decide is the way you represent the problem in the first place. Because framing in the end determines what you see and what you do not see. And what you see determines how you act. But there's something deeper going on here, more, more important. If I go back to this picture, some of you, many of you must have seen that one or must have counted that one. Okay, you, you've counted that one. If you tell me 11, if you tell me five, you have counted that triangles. But of course the zero people will tell you, how can you say it's a triangle? I don't see any data here. There's a 5% of the triangles in terms of data here. There's nothing about a triangle here. The reason you were able to recognize a triangle is because you have engaged in a fundamental human cognition that frames, mental models enables you to do. You engage in what is called counterfactual thinking. So counterfactual thinking is not the idea of going against the fact. It's the idea to, to that it is ability to go well beyond the situation you are in, well beyond the data you have to extrapolate in a meaningful way. I'm saying this is meaningful to say there's a triangle here. 
So counterfactual thinking is what enables you to ask what if questions and try to play with it, extrapolate with it. It's also the, your ability, and I hope to show you an example of that, to know something that is interestingly unobservable. To do, to claim something that might be correct without having the data to prove it. In fact, a counterfactual is one of the three main components of, of frames. There is, we call them the three C's in the book because it's fancy. I feel like I'm a consultant of the three C's. Um, you have causality, counterfactuals, uh, and constraints. But to me, counterfactual is really where the power of frame is coming from. Okay, that's really the benefit of being able to properly represent the situations. In fact, if you think about it, each time you make a decision, you have to engage in counterfactual thinking. You, you're playing the what if game. What if I do A? What if I do B? What if I take my date to a, a dinner tonight to a restaurant? So then you imagine all the nice things that can happen at dinner, maybe after, so I'll skip that counterfactual. But, or you can compare to what if I go to the movie? And then you can imagine all the nice things that can happen in the movie theaters. I'm going to skip that part too. But basically, in the end, when you make a decision, fundamentally, you're deciding among different counterfactuals. Each time humanity is engaging in a meaningful activity, there is counterfactual thinking at play. And you see that in the sciences all the time. Again, I hate to break the news to you, but yes, humanity is responsible for global warming. Right? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to debate that. The question how is how do we know? Because if you really think about it, if you really want to assess causality here, what you really need to have is a benchmark. Okay, you will need a benchmark, but without us on it. You need exactly the same world we have, but without us on it. And then you compare. Okay, if I take out humanity, I don't see the warming. Yes, we are responsible for global warming. But you see the problem here. It's impossible to have direct data of what is in essence an alternative reality. We exist in this reality, right? So we cannot kill each other. Maybe we will at some point, but there will be nobody to see what's going on to the climate then. Now what we do and how we know there is such a thing as human-made global warming is we can create a counterfactual. And how we do that is what we build a representations, a model about how the climate works in all reality. And in that representation, in that model, we do a what if exercise, which shut down in that representation human activities. And then we simulate, we literally simulate, we run a counterfactual. And what we observe in this counterfactual is that no humans, no warming. That's how we know we are responsible for global warming. And again, we can know that without being able to directly have direct data on the unobservable, that is an alternative reality to which we will never have access to, an earth without us. Okay, now these raise though a very fundamental question. How is it that some of our counterfactuals at least turn out to be accurate? Because I keep telling you what you can imagine a counterfactual is extrapolating, a, a, beyond the situation we are in. Uh, but you know better than I do, as much as I do that, you can imagine whatever you want. You can fancy whatever you want. That does not make whatever you fancy true. So how is it that our counterfactuals are working well? I mean, one of the part of the reason is because those counterfactuals are not flight of fancy. It is, and in, in the word of uh, neuroscientific scientists, sorry, um, I, I love this metaphor, they call it a highly controlled hallucinations. You hallucinate because it's, it's not reality, but it's highly controlled. And in the book, we talk about dreaming with constraints. Okay, and in particular, those type of imagination, these type of simulations is guided, is controlled by a second C of our three Cs. It's controlled by causality. In each of our mental model, in each of our representation embedded in them, we are making causal claim I mean, we may be wrong, but there is always a common causal claim about how the world works. And we use this causal claim to guide our counterfactuals. In fact, the brain has a knack to see causality in the world. We see the world through causal lenses. And sometimes we are correct. And when we are correct, we can use these causal links to guide our counterfactuals. So to make it more concrete, I would like you to look at this poor guy who is about to push that wall. And you can feel the pain already, huh? Okay, at best he's ending up in a, in a hospital. Um, now you can, you know what's going to happen or what like, is likely going to happen, but you know that not because you have experience, 
many data points in your life where you saw people pushing a wall and getting hit by another wall. You probably never experienced that, in fact, in your life. And still, you know. Why do you know? Is because you can simulate it. You can run the counterfactual in your mind. You can see in your mind, even sometimes in slow motion, how those walls are going to fall. But you do not run any counterfactuals. I mean, those walls are not flying in the air. They fall in a very specific way. Why? Because you have framed the situation around one crucial causal link. And that causal link is very simple. It's an if and then statement. It's if a wall falls, then the next one will fall as well. And you use that causal link again and again and again to guide what's going on in your mind, to guide your simulation until you literally see this. Okay, so in the end, what the frames is doing for you fundamentally, and this is to me, a very important C of the three Cs. The frame is constraining your thinking. It's all about those constraints. And when, when I mean by constraining that, it's really constraining your focus by highlighting some aspect of the situations and putting other aspect in the background. For instance, the fact that we were talking about a man here and not a woman does not matter. You didn't use that to guide your counterfactual. You put that in the background. The fact that the guy had, had a hat, I do not know if you remember, but in the picture I show you, the guy had a hat. Doesn't matter. You put that in the background. But what your mind is doing, thanks to your frames, is to highlight this causal link I was talking about and to focus on that link to guide your counterfactual. I think the best way to understand the crucial role of constraint in your thinking is to look at what's going on when you try to think without constraint, when you try to think outside the box. It's a very inspiring thing to do. I mean, and when you try to do that, you feel great, you feel liberated because you can think widely, not judgmental, you can think whatever you want. Uh, and, and there are great books that tells you how to do that well. The problem is that we know studies after study, there's about three decades almost of research about that. There's studies after study that show that if you try to nudge people to think outside the box, they are going to hurt themselves. They are going to feel great, but they are going to hurt themselves. They become poorer decision makers and less innovative. Why? Because the magic is in the box. The machine is the, con the, the constraint itself. The magic is to come up with the right representation and to use these constraints to properly elicit um, powerful counterfactuals. And machines can't do that. Machines cannot come up with their own representation of the world unless you have hard coded in their program. No, they cannot come up alone with that and run different counterfactuals unless, again, you have hard-coded those frames in, in, their, in their programs or the way they are trained. Um, I want to give you, because I really want to give space to more questions, but I want to give you a last example of that. I do not know if you know, but um, uh, Beethoven wrote nine symphonies, and there's a last one, the tenth one, that he didn't finish. Okay, When we say he didn't finish, he really didn't finish. What, he, what we know for sure is that he wanted to write a 10th symphony that we know pretty much for sure. And then we have a bunch of papers that are almost very hard to read. Um, even if you know music and can read music, this is a bit of a mess. And but basically he wrote different ideas on different pieces of papers. Okay, and we know that Beethoven, he was a very impulsive writer. So like suddenly he got excited and the more he was writing, the more excited it was and the more it was hard to read what he was trying to write. But basically, we do not know in which order things are supposed to fit, and there's a lot of holes in his so-called unfinished symphony. The thing is that two months ago, or even less, not two months ago, an AI a machine managed to complete and finish that symphony. So much so that they were able to play it live. It was six weeks ago, I think. It was in Bonn. That was the world premiere. And trust me, I mean, it's like um, I'm not I'm not a specialist. I appreciate music, but it, it really sounds like Beethoven. Now, I know, you know, if you are an expert, you say, well, it's not exactly Beethoven. It's like, you know, if it were Beethoven, it would be even better. What do I know? It really sounds like it. All right now, if you go, and it's impressive, and it's like, you cannot, I mean, I defy uh, experts to really identify which part is 100% the AI and which part is, was Beethoven. It's very hard to tell. But if you look beyond the machines, you will find human framing. And I don't want to guide you into the readings here. I mean, this is an article that, the people who created the machine wrote, and what they said is that before being able to train the machine, they had to understand and represent to build a frame about the way a bit of an, or his creative process, okay, the, the way he was thinking, his mindset, so his frame, 
when he was trying to develop this uh, 10th symphony. And so what they did is that then they used his human-made representation about how Beethoven thing, and they use it to guide the training or to help the machine to say, well, generate music, but please pick up the one that looked like this frame. And that's how you get something that sounds like Beethoven. And so in the end, if you go deeper and deeper, you will always find human framing, the ability to represent. And I hope that after these hours together, you will help everyone um, make framing great again. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Many, many thanks, Francis. And I think we all got, thanks to our mental model, uh, a first glimpse why he's such a highly awarded teacher. Well, I don't, don't trust what Moni is saying. <laughs> no. There's a lot of competitions, you know, at this end. <laughs> <laughs> no, many thanks for, for this very inspiring impulse. And many thanks for this very inspiring book. Uh, everyone who hasn't read it, I strongly recommend to get a buy and, and read it because it's it's really inspiring as inspiring as as your um sort of synopsis Thanks. of this book uh as molly said i immediately open up the question to you but let me break the ice with, with a few uh, the the ice with a few questions of of my own um why did you make such a big deal in the book and you also made the point mm -hmm. here that framing is uniquely human why is that so important to you? Because this is what will help us if you want to survive in an age of artificial intelligence. There's no doubt that artificial intelligence is going to play an increasing role. And we see that, I mean, all through success are true. That is, um, humanity has experienced a lot of technological disruptions, but I think what is a bit special about this one is it takes over some of the things we thought were defining us as humans such as deciding, such as creativity, even Beethoven, which we think is art. And then suddenly you start to see the machines. So there is this sense that, um, yes, the machine and big data is going to take over a lot of our um, ability to decide. And there's some truth in that. But that's why we insist on the importance of friends, because we only looking at one side of the picture, we forget a fundamental, fundamental superpower. This is Victor, by the way, uh, my co-author that you know well, who used this expression. The superpower that we can choose our ability to represent the world and machines cannot do that. It's impossible for a machine to do that. The term framing, um, I mean, describes something that has been as old as human, as humankind. Right? Of course, of course. Why, why is the term itself and the technique, the cognitive, cognitive, cognitive technique behind it, getting more and more attention. I mean, I think on the, on, on the contrary is we have forgotten about it over time. I mean, we have been told, as I said, like we suck at decision-making. We have been told that, and all that is true. I mean, we are making mistakes. We are biased. We are not consistent in our decision-making. Uh, we look at all the success of the machines. So what we try to say is like, remember who we are. If you look at all the success of humanity, as you see that in the science is very explicit. You can tell the history of science and the history of reframing, of changing representations. You can tell many business story about change of business models. A business model is a representation. It's a frame about how a business might be successful or not. And behind a lot of the success story you hear and you see, it's not the technological disruptions is a change of mental models, is a change of business model in this case. So we, we have this strong sense that we talk about big data, big data, machine, machine learning. And on this way, we, we tend to forget about what makes us great as, as human beings. Um, and I, I want to add one more thing is that what you read very often, especially in healthcare, and I've, I've less and less, thanks God, but, but basically the future of a doctor I read again and again is that, oh, I'm going to take care of the emotion of the patients and AI is going to take care of the rest. It's like my, my wife is a pediatrician. She's taking care of the emotion of the patients, but I strongly believe that there's more, her place in the, in the, in the future will still be there thanks to our ability to represent the situation and framing. What makes framing different from just understanding the context? Well, what is, how do you understand the context? Mm -hmm. Okay, you understand the context because you can represent that context. 
and the, uh, the frame is a representation of that context. So you can only understand and, and be aware of that understanding if you have a proper representation of that context. So frame is what helps you understand in the end. And, and, and there is variety of, as we, as we saw with the triangles, you have a very ambiguous situation, ask these ambiguous questions, and then to make sense of it, people bring different representations that will lead to different decisions, basically. Your book is a hymn, uh, indeed, to the pluralism of different. Yeah, I didn't talk too much about it, but you're right. Yeah, there's a big, big, um, yes. Which leads us back to the question, yeah. well, okay, now I understood that uh, in decision-making processes, framing is a crucial, possibly the most crucial part. Yeah. But for sure. then I have to make a meta decision. What frame do I choose? How do I know that I've chosen the right frame? That, that you will never know. I mean, that, you know, it's, it's I mean, you, I'm not a philosopher, but you know, that, that has been, <laughs> you know, like the history of philosophy about how you know that your representation are correct. Mm -hmm. But what is, and that's why we talk about- It can give us hints how we can at least- Yeah, I mean, it's like, that, that's why we insist in the book that, that your best bet, um, and I didn't talk too much about it, is to have a large repertoire of representation at your, at your hand, to be able to look at the situation for many different points of view, so that at least you have a choice of, of um, representation. I mean, a metaphor that we, I think, also use in the book is to think of frames as tools. It's like you can have one hammer, and then you will see the world with, through that hammer again and again. So you're going to, to hit anything on the wall. Well, if you have a screwdriver, drivers, it's like um, you're not sure the screwdriver is the right one, but at least you can choose between two. Now, imagine you have more tools like that, and more diverse, more different, then you're more likely, I guess, I mean, to have the right represent or the, you know a fruitful representation. That's more the the, the wording I will use. Speaking of tools, how can <laughs> we use AI as a tool in order to improve framing? Can that work? Can yeah, you give I, us hints? No, I, I, I thank you for this question because this is really where we see that with the Hallison example. It's like, I think one of the great future, I mean, right now we are talking about AI that help us make better decisions. I mean, self-driving cars, uh, diagnostics and all that. And all that is true, but I think the real value of AI is to in fact make us better framers. Um, and, and you see that with, with Hallison. I mean, the story of Hallison is that AI said just, look, there's these molecules that seem to work. AI did not come with any explanation, any representation about why that specific molecule was working. You need then framing to come back. So basically the only thing that AI did is to attract the attentions of the human brain. And then they went back and used like classical representations about how the, the biology works to uncover what made to understand, to go back to what you were saying, what made these particular molecules so powerful, and they uncover it, and it's beautiful. I mean, I'm going to skip the detail, but the, 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 what they uncover is beautiful. So you need, then you go back to using frames to understand, and you see that with um, chess, for instance. I mean, you know, DeepMind they have this alpha zero um, algorithm that beat the best chess players, and then you have chess grandmaster went back and look at how alpha zero was playing just to learn. And what they realize is they learn about how they misframe some situation. And in particular, what, what grand, grand, grand masters are doing and all human players are doing when they play chess, if you know the rules is, we try to protect the queen. We put a lot of value on certain pieces. What Alpha Zero does is that it's ready to sacrifice a lot of pieces to have a specific position on the board. So the grand grand master realized that their way of playing, their frame of the game, had to change and to for them to focus more to put more in the foreground the position on the on of the piece on the board that they did it before but not enough basically so this is a story about how ai showed how human how they can reframe their own thinking but ai cannot do the framing itself because ai does not explain anything it does not tell you why it's doing x and y victor said in your co-author Victor Meyer Schoenberger said in an interview that you can train framing just as you can train a sport, how you can train a muscle. How would that work yeah, for all his... of us who want to be masters of framing? He has his nice metaphor about um, um, framing as a muscle, as a cognitive muscle. The, the, so what you can train, 
is the act of applying representations and generate counterfactuals. When you, when you try to make a decision, the first thing is to try to be aware about what is your mental models highlighting right now and which other aspect are you putting in the backgrounds. And that, that you, can, you can train yourself to also recognize what are the causal assumptions I'm using right now. And then you can also play. And in fact, you know, a lot of uh, kids are learning to do that at an early age, play to do the what if game, to do the counterfactuals. This is a central difference between in human infants with animals. So animals, they play to repeat behavior that they will use as, as, as grown up. But what human infants are doing, they do pretend play, which is fundamentally different. They do what if, you know, what if this is, um, this is a doll is, is my, my daughter's, what if I do X? And this is to harness the ability to think in counterfactuals. And you do that until um, adulthood. So that can be trained. What is very hard and cannot be easily trained is to come up with a totally new representations a new frame. I mean, and you see that in sciences, it's very hard to be an Einstein in some sense, to, to bring his new model about how the world works. And let me, let me insist that what Einstein did is to come up with a new representation. He went well beyond the data he had. So it's it all happened in his mind. It's, it's really in the end a mental model. He, and that is very hard to do, to come up with a totally new uh, frame. Uh, that is hard to train, yeah. Let me show you one last question. I get my first one here and please you in, in the room get prepared as well to, to shoot us uh, some questions. What stick to my mind from the interviews the two of us had uh, mm -hmm. when I interviewed you two years ago, <coughs> exactly what back then you described the uh, counterfactuals mm -hmm. to me as an exercise of projection. Mm -hmm. We are projecting ourselves in different futures and different yeah. situations and then sort of tests in our imagination what might suit us yeah. or not. What if constraints change? So you see you're doing a counterfactual now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're asking me what if questions. The, the way you do counterfactuals is that, the, 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 and so I'm going to be a bit more technical here, is that essentially you mutate some constraints in your frame and then you do what if, exactly what you did with me. It's like, what if I mutate one specific constraint what happens next? You see that uh, with global warming, the only constraint in that model about the climate system that our dear scientists did, climate scientists, is to mutate the presence of humans. They turn that off and then they simulate what's going on. And the quality of our counterfactuals depend essentially on the quality of the constraints we apply to the problem. So that, that's what is very hard, is how to find the right constraints so that we do not imagine something crazy. We project ourselves in a meaningful way. The meaning is from the constraint, is from the box we are applying to it. So this is his mutation of constraint one by one sometimes that will enable you to imagine different paths. Let me yeah. challenge that frame. Sure. You said in your, that, that nobody is, is there to observe what happens if nobody, if we take humans yeah. off yeah. Uh, the planet, yeah. unless we've already colonized Mars, right? Even Maybe then, or yes, then it's too late. Yes, <laughs> good point. <laughs> anyway, I, I get the, the first question. Many thanks uh, from uh, Saitan Dutta. Uh, she, she sends us uh, the, the following question. If machines are more creative and make better decisions, does it mean they are more prone to decisions biased of the people who configured them? There's a lot of ifs in it. You probably wouldn't. I, I, you wouldn't I, consent with the first. It's. A, I, I like. I like the if. I mean, yes, ma machine. Okay, machine are biased. There's a lot of uh, uh, fight in whether it's coming from the algorithm. I don't believe it's because the algorithm is biased, although it may play a role. But certainly, the data on which machines are trained are biased because, in the end, you should think of data. The, I mean, the metaphor I would use is that they are the footprints of our representations. Like you think about temperature, for instance, it's not that you see numbers in nature. Those temperature are constructs that are, are done with your representations. And because some of our representations are biased against gender, for instance, you will retrieve them in the data on which the machine is trained. So, so the machine, unless you don't pay attention, will propagate those biases. 
Now, the good news with machine compared to humans, it's easier to debias a machine than to debias a human mind. So you can, you can sometimes find trick to debias your machines. So yes, machines are biased as much as, um, as we are. Any questions in the room? Uh, yes, please, please, yeah. Please take, I hope take. this works. Um, so if I understood you correctly, then uh, you say the superpower of humans is to frame or which are like machines are not able to yeah. and never will be. Yeah. But in my mind, like my mind can imagine like a cascade where like machine hard codes frames into other machines like humans do right now. And then just try this over and over to uh, like figure out which frames work and which not. But um, so if I understood you correctly, this will never be possible. Um, can you tell me why so, you don't so think so? What I think, okay, so let, let us be careful. Um, what I think is not possible is the machine to have the ability to create its own frames, its own representations. So let me, let me reframe what I'm saying. <laughs> if you believe that machine can do that, to me, it's equivalent to believe that machine at some point can reach consciousness. Because if machines can develop their own representation of the world, at some point, nothing prevent them to represent themselves. And when you start to represent yourself, you're talking about consciousness. So, so for me, if you buy that machines can create their own representation of the world, you need to buy that they can become conscious. And for me, it's too hard to swallow at this stage. Now you can dream and do counterfactual where that exists, but I don't see any reason, any hint that this is going to be happening. So that's why I'm saying, I don't believe in the machine's ability to represent by itself. Sure. Let me, let, me, let me make a point to that. Do you really believe that this is sort of due to the current state of technology that we know, or is that a fundamental barrier of which you believe will never be surmounted by, by whatever kind of computer? Okay. So, so never say never. <laughs> um, what, I, what I'm saying is that believing in that, and I, I do not want to offend anyone, but, but believing in that is the same as believing in God. So it's un, not provable, um, mm. it's, it's having faith. Um, mm. And I do not have any tangible indications um, or proper representations that will enable me to, to think that I can dream it, I can, I can see how it will work and play out Terminator in my mind, uh, but um, yes. But the good news is that we don't know the technological path in to a world in which that would be possible, I assume. Yeah, whether it's a good news or bad news, I don't know. Maybe we want to have a conscious machines. Maybe they create a better world. I have no idea. <laughs> we, we'll discuss that with, with the hyper-rationalists that you're mentioning yeah. in, in, yes, in the books. Yes. There's another question by a fellow, uh, a colleague of yours, Professor Henry uh, Sawaman, who's, ah, uh, who's, who's hi, asking. He's here. Hi. <laughs> he must be there online. somewhere online. In okay. the clouds. So uh, he is asking, is there a difference between a frame and a model? And if they are similar, yeah. can AI not also come up, come up with models? Well, I mean, so this, is, the same this is exactly the same questions. It's like, um, yes, they are the same. Um, no, um, so let us talk about frames and models. We, for instance, we use a lot of mathematical models in the end is because sometimes some of those representations are, are too much for our brains to handle. So you write them down with a language, which is the language of mathematics. But, but, but in the end, this is to help you think in your mind uh, about how the world might play out. So for me, frames and frame mental models representations are the same thing. And this is a unique human ability. And I'm going to give the answer to Henry the same as I, I, I gave you, which is if you believe that machines can come up with their own representations, you must believe that at some point they can represent themselves. And now you're talking about consciousness. And I feel very uncomfortable betting on that. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, well, since we're all witnessed COVID situation, uh, would you say your opinion about how we changed our frames during this whole time <laughs> um, because it seems to be really difficult and that yeah. we struggle during this time and this is at yeah. least in my opinion why we have such bad consequences on this whole disease reaction no you, you An excellent question yes. if you read the book yeah. Yeah. You'd, you'd, you'd find a, no, a direct it, reference and i'm not sure if you have reframed the question or uh, the thesis on 
uh, that comparison between how how Great Britain addressed and no 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 like it's that. a great thank you for asking I mean perfect uh, question yeah yes yeah, it's, 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 and, and we talk about it the book. <laughs> we, we we talk we talk about it in in the book I mean the so let let us let us be clear it's like let us go back to the beginning of the epidemic of COVID the only thing we had is our models we didn't have much data about this new uh, virus the only predictions we could make is by um, representations about virus spread out. Again, there were absolutely no data. I remember I was attending the World Health Summit um, here in Berlin and the, the, my, my beloved doctors that I, I love to work with them, but they're like, they were, where are the guidelines? We need empirical proven guidelines because that's how modern medicine works. Sorry, it's a new virus, there's no guidelines. You need to use simulations, you need to use mental models. So, so the only way we had to fight in the beginning is our representation about how things works. And what is very interesting is to see how different countries started to represent uh, the, the, the virus. And we talk about, we contrast, for instance, Great Britain's. Um, again, I hope there's not so many Brits uh, in, in the rooms. Uh, that, that's my friends. It's like, but. That's a good <laughs> statement. <laughs> and they have, they have they, that, 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 the, that's, that's what is. Um, I'm really sad is because they had the best epidemiologic in the world who, who could see uh, what the rest of the world was seeing. But basically, the British government was framing, representing COVID as flu, basically. I mean, a tough flu, right? But, and so that was and the way they wanted to tackle it. What is very interesting is New Zealand, because New Zealand started to look at that situation and they looked at Great Britain and they looked at what Great Britain was doing. And they started to do the same thing, to follow you know, the European rules. But New Zealand has an advantage compared to Great Britain. New Zealand is in Asia, and so they had two frames they could choose from. Because while Great Britain was doing that, you had Korea, Singapore, who had the experience of SARS. And they were using a totally different representation to tackle the same, same virus. And so New Zealand started to use that representation, implement that frame to think about it this way. But they could choose between two friends. I mean, it goes back to the to the hammer and the screwdrivers, and they did a conscious choice to switch representations. I mean, Ken interviewed the Minister of Health, and he really described how they changed their mindset, which is really a change of frame, to tackle it as trying to kill it basically. And they are semi-successful, as we know, but they they did great progress compared to the rest of of us. So so yes, the misrepresenting can kill. If you if you misrepresent this type of situation, you can kill people. There's a question by Anonymous. No, Thinking anonymous. else. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking. Oh, what's the difference between thinking outside the box and putting a new frame? The new thinking outside the box is the idea that you free yourself from constraints. Mm -hmm. Putting a new frame is deliberating choosing the right box in which you are going to think. So you need the box to think because you need the box to guide your thinking. I mean, that's why physics is so powerful and efficient, so accurate, because it's highly constrained. In, when you do physics, you cannot think anything. <laughs> you have to respect certain constraints. And sometimes someone breaks those constraints and change everything upside down, and then you have a new theory that may be working or not. So choosing a different frame, a new frame will elicit new representations, but you need that box to, to think. Thinking outside the box, and this is, you know, all the, the brainstorming sessions or the brainstorming techniques do not work because they force you efficiently, unfortunately, to try to think without constraints. And then you try to think whatever you want, but it's not going to be very useful. Mm -hmm. And so in the book, you, you have several examples where some people are just better in realizing when constraints, for example, technological constraints or market constraints change. Yes, yes. Could, you, could you give one of those examples to sort of I mean, uh, it's, elaborate on that? Because I think that that's where constraints and models really meet. I, I, I think, for instance, if you look at most of the big success you see in companies, I, I think I alluded that, uh, to that earlier. Um, I'm going to take an old example because I'm old and I remember that one. So sorry for being old. Uh, it's like 
blast from the past, you know, the last century example. No, it's, it's one of the most, sorry, I don't want to offend anybody, but the most dull company, which is Dell. Okay, Dell, in fact, brought down the PC industry of IBM on its knee. I mean, destroyed the PC, uh, the PC branch of IBM, basically. It totally revolutionized the, the way um, computers were produced and marketed. But there is no technological innovations, really. I mean, it's not that Dell in his garage, Michael, I think what was his first name, sorry, um, he didn't come up with a new technology. In fact, he did not even create a new market. He stole the market from, from IBM. So what he did fundamentally, in a sense, is that he changed representation. And in a nutshell, you know, what IBM and all the big uh, company at the time were doing is that they were trying to define the, the computer they wanted to produce in advance. They were making predictions. Okay, that's my demand. I'm going to, pro to do economy of scales and build 15 different computers and gazillions of each one of them. So I can leverage economy of scale. It's going to be cheap to produce. What, what uh, Dell did is that it inverse the decision point. Instead of deciding what to produce before demand is realized, it waited that demand is realized. And then based on that demand, set up a new process, which is component, right? But to quickly produce computer for that demand. And so it reduced the cost of inventory, the, the cost of lost sales, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's an example where by changing representation in business, you can disrupt an industry. And you see that with Zara, there are gazillions of examples. I think there's a question on your left. Yes, please. Yeah. Hi, do you have any uh, life hacking tips based on your ability to reframe? Do you use reframing with your kids, with your personal motivation or with yourself in ways that we would find accessible? Oh, I had that one. <laughs> yeah, he had a, okay, I hope my family is not watching now. Uh, I don't think so because I know my, my daughter uh, yeah, is fencing right now. So it's like, uh, um, I mean, I can give you a, a personal example. Um, which is a hard one, uh, is my, my oldest uh, daughter who was born in, in 27. She was born with a heart defect. Um, and um, we wanted, if she needed a surgery. And the big question was uh, where to do the surgery. It's a case sometimes I teach uh, to some of my students sometimes. It depends on uh, how I feel within my class. But in the, 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 you, so I'm, I'm going to skip the details about, about the different hospitals we had. But they, I, I started to engage in that decision using a specific representations about what a good hospital is and all that. But then I was aware that, okay, I'm, I was engaging very quickly in that frame. And I stepped back. Thanks God my wife was a pediatrician that had two. And then we consciously use a totally different representations, which is called decision trees. I'm going to skip the, which is, which is a frame to force us to think about the same decisions from a totally different angle. And thanks to this change of representation, it was a very conscious act. You know, I didn't want, because of all that, I, I, I knew I didn't want to be stuck in my own frame. So consciously I forced myself to look at the same problem using a totally different representation, which has called, in this case, decision trees, which helped me change my mind. And I would not be here to tell that story if you didn't, everything is okay and everybody's happy. So this is a personal example that I try to do. I mean, I'm trying and it, it takes self-discipline to each time the, you, you make a decision and a choice to identify what are the causal assumptions, how you believe the work is going to play out, what makes you believe it's going to play out like that. And, and it might be a good assumption. I'm not saying change your mind all the time. It's not about reframing. It's you, you, most of the time you have the right representations, but be aware of it. Like be very conscious about what you're doing. And I'm going to finish what is super important is to have a vast variety of representation of the world, right? It's, it's to have this flexibility to having friends from different culture, for instance, or uh, seek out different point of view on your problem, not your, your own reflex point of view. That's what I'm doing in my personal life. Yes, please. Would you use the microphone, please? Apologies. To that very last point you just made there, that yeah. on an individual level, it makes sense to have many different frames, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also, from what I understand, 
also on a societal level, no. we have frames that are not working well at all for us, <laughs> that are preventing us from using people's potential. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm at ECP, I teach LGBT plus leaders mm -hmm. and female leaders. Mm -hmm. And I'm so um, disheartened how slow the diversity movement mm -hmm. is happening. We need access mm -hmm. to this potential. Mm -hmm. So what could you mm -hmm. share with us with all that you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. in terms of on a societal level, changing frames at a, at a quicker pace. Okay, thank you for your questions. This is something I didn't touch upon in the presentation, but there's a whole chapter dedicated to that. I'm fully aligned with you first. It's the, the difference I have in that. I, we do not believe, I don't believe that there's such a thing as bad frame. Right. There's one exception that we can discuss. There's no bad frame, there's bad framing. So there's misapplications of representations to the wrong context. So, you know, a tool is not bad by itself. What is bad is to use the tool in the wrong directions. At the societal levels, um, uh, and I'm with you, I mean, what we need is a, we call that pluralist. So we need to live in the same society, many different ways of looking at the world. That's why I have a joke with, with, uh, with make framing great again in the end, because even Trumpism has its place. It's like, we, we, we have to, to uh, have that. What is very hard, and that I think in organizations and in society is what is very hard is when you have different representation, different frame, and they are really different, you have clashes of frames. It's like if they were similar, they would not be in contradictions. And the, what is very hard for organization, and that when I work with organization, I'm trying to have them that, which is the need to accept frictions. It's not comfort comfortable. It's like we run away from friction, but we need to have this ability in an organization. So in society, we can discuss that, but at least in business and in organizations, we need to accept that there will be discomfort, there will be friction, and this is okay. Because what you see with organizations is that people, CEOs, um, run away from those frictions because it, you know, it prevents efficiency. I think friction is bad. It's, it's, it prevents us to, to be efficient. But if you want to have the diversity of point of, 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 point of view in your organizations, and it's, it's not only, you know, it's gender, it's, it's all sort of different point of view, you need to nurture that friction. And I'm going to give you an example that CEOs, some CEOs are doing, which we, again, sorry, we mentioned that in the book is what, what they call, it's not from us, but that they, what they call corporate Cassandra. So if you know the myth of Cassandra, uh, which date back from the, the Greek mythology, they, there was this beautiful uh, Troy princess and Apollon fell in love with her and gave her the gift of foresight. But uh, Cassandra said, thank you very much, but you know, I'm not attracted by you at all, leave me alone. And so to curse her, Apollo uh, cursed her by saying like, you can see the future, but nobody will be able to listen to you. And she went to Troy and said, well, you know, competition is going to take over the Greek islands is going to take over Troy and nobody listened to her. And I think you see the CEO of Pixar, yes, if I'm, if I'm correct, the CEO of Pixar, what he said is that people who are really cursed is not Cassandra, it's the organizations, the inability to listen to a different point of view. And so what he did is that he tried to have a system, an organization that will nurture his people like, you know, frankly, they are toxic, you know, they are like complaining, they're like saying, it's going to be a catastrophe, but instead of shutting them down, they need to have a place and you need to find a way to live with that uh, discomfort. So to go back to your question, if you want true diversity to flourish, the first thing that an organization needs to do is to accept frictions, is to accept disagreement in a way that is not uh, doing what is happening in the US and in many other countries to bring down the, uh, the organization to its knees. So th there is a, uh, an equilibrium to find. But again, organizations run away from that. Typically, a CEO doesn't want that. You know, I don't want any problem. I want efficiency. Here's our share model. Here how we are going to be successful. Align, 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 align. This is what needs to be broken first, I think. But then you use the Me Too movement, for example, in the yeah. book as a very powerful example for uh, intelligent framing for a good social cost, right? Oh, correct. I mean, it's like, of course, you can frame extremely efficient. That's what yeah. we're trying to say. So if you, if you, same for gay marriage, I mean, they were extremely, uh, the gay community was extremely successful 
in the US, extremely I mean, successful to have gay marriage accepted because they reframe the debate. They, they frame it from, and before it was equality, equal rights. And then they managed to have the discourse away from that. They did it consciously. They did it away from that around, it's a matter of love. It's like we love each other. And as soon as they started to do that, you have the sur suburb uh, women who had nothing to do with gay people who started to say, yeah, yeah, I can, I can live with that. I can embrace that frame. So using a different frame, it can be extremely powerful for evil and good. Mm -hmm. Time flies. We have 10 minutes left. I think there was, yes, a question there, please. And then I'll get back to the online questions. Uh, yes, some machine learning models uh, like neural network, I think it's very hard for them to get the global optimum solutions. They can usually get the local optimum solutions. Uh, so my question is, can this be regarded as a case that machine may also frame? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why they frame the machine in your example. What make them frame? Uh, some machine learning models can only use the historical information. Always, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah. It's, it's, you know, machine learning is always based on past data. Yeah. So, so which for me is the reason why even neural network won't be able to frame. I mean, a neural network just give you, this is my answer, mm -hmm. and they will not give you any reason for why it is. Yes. It's like, so, so because they cannot frame, there is no causal explanation. What, what AI people are trying to do is to help the human better frame and understand what the machine is doing. So there's a lot of explainable AI, but it's not AI explaining, it's how can I make me humans his answer intelligible to me in my own representations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, neural networks cannot frame anything, basically. Francis, what is interesting that uh, among the questions I hear, I think four out of five that are on the list just, just go in the same direction. You haven't convinced, um, at least not, the five people who asked those questions, the limits of AI, and Maya just fuel that a little bit. I, yeah, I, I sure, consent sure. with you, but yeah, yeah. in the sense that possibly AI could sort of randomly throw out, throw out frames and then test it with humans or test it with themselves. Oh, you, will, you, you will need, so, so again, I will, I, will, uh, I will go back to the answer I having is, if you really believe that a machine can start to frame the world by itself, to create its own representations, you believe that at some point it's going to frame itself to have a representation of itself. So then you believe in, in strong AI to use the terminology. Now, if you're ready to buy that, then you need to, you need to buy both. Then you're consistent with yourself. Um, I don't buy one, so I cannot buy the other. The other reason is like, even when you train a machine, when you use neural, neural network, you need even the data to be presented in a very certain frame, in a very certain representation. And then this is in, on that representation of the data that the machine is trained. So this outside representation is based by human, it's not the machine, unless you take that machine, you use the human frame to take that machine to say, you machine represent the data this way, the way I frame it for you in advance. And that I have not seen, and I don't think it's, it's, it's um, I don't think it's possible. Fabian Poulkert has a good one on that one. He, he asks, do you think it is possible for an, AI, for, for an AI to find frames in random data where humans are not able to find frames? For instance, he gives the example, one example could be the exploration of dark matter or black holes where we, where we have sort of data and then I mean we, think we about, have random data we can't really think, think about even the notion of dark matter the notion of dark matter is a representation of reality it's a model mm -hmm. it's not the machine who created that representation it's us who created that representation mm -hmm. so within that boundaries maybe you can see the same with the with Harrison that I showed I mean within that boundary about how antibiotic works or how we believe we represent the world work you can use AI to help us find new solutions like a seen, but that search is made within a representation that is coming from us in the end. Mm -hmm. So you see that in physics. So I, I go back to the point you're saying, I, I'm convinced that AI can help us reframe and frame better by doing exactly that, by 
trying to, in the frame we create around that machine, help us look at this data differently. But again, that works because we have this ability to represent the world first. Oh, ha. We got time for one more question. I think it was you first. Please. But I mean, I'm happy to talk uh, outside after. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm not disappearing. Yeah. Yes. So there is a saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Mm -hmm. Let's just, I'll, I haven't read your book, I'll be mm -hmm. honest, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do a wrong you, simpli honesty, <laughs> But you can change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do probably a wrong simplification of how you model mm -hmm. the limits of technology yeah. to, to framing, that yeah. the humans are still needed to frame them. Yeah. A century ago or 50 years ago, that limit was understood as it will never understand language or whatever other example you can give. Let's assume that your model is wrong. What would be the next? What is a more correct model that you think will be the next step of our understanding? So I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, you're saying, let's assume I'm wrong, that the, that the machine can All models frame. are wrong. What would be the next step of our understanding of the limits of technology? Because you, you basically define the limits of technology by the humans will have to explain reality to it or explain the world. But a century ago, they thought that machine would not be able to understand language, but they can today. Yes, I mean, no, they no. cannot. They, they can, can understand, understand the voice. They cannot simulate it. They can... cannot understand anything. <laughs> they they can translate voice to something else. That's Let... something different. It's like they do not, machine do not understand language. <laughs> I mean, but, but the point is not about what was a century ago. It was, let's assume okay. that you currently define some boundary of the, of, between technology and humans. Where the, where so what if that boundary is wrong, basically? What would be a finer understanding of it in 20 years? Uh, I don't know. It's like you're telling me if I'm wrong, I think then you open up for indeed um, the technology being able to develop consciousness, I guess, mm -hmm. to have strong AI, if, but, if you believe that, that they can frame. They but can wrong frame. doesn't mean that you're 100% wrong. Like, <laughs> no. physical, physical mechanics is wrong, but it's very useful. Your theory well, could be wrong, but still very useful, but at the next step. So, so first I'm saying, so let me, okay. I, it's, 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 I guess it's a longer, it's a longer debate. I'm, I'm, we say that we got two minutes left. <laughs> yes, so let me, let me, um, I'm not sure I grasp uh, the frame you have in mind <laughs> and I'm happy to engage in that. I mean, I want to go back to the first claim you make that all models are wrong, but they are useful. And I agree. I mean, when you say model is wrong, it's like, what is the alternative, right? It's like, it's, um, who cares that the, what is important for us is that we can build representations that help us achieve our goals. And you say like, okay, physics mechanics is wrong, Einstein theory is wrong as well, you know, or uh, quantic is wrong as well. The, the, the point is not that it's wrong. The point is that do we keep and nurture our ability to continue to come up with new representations? And then your question is, well, will machine, you know, if I'm wrong, like 100, I do not know, but it's like basically the gray area I can see that the machine work with us to help us come up with these new representations. I, I believe there's synergies here. I don't think the machine by itself would be able to do it. So I, you know, I do not know where you try to lead me in terms of which constraint you want me to, to mutate a bit or make it more flexible. But I think the, the future I can see and I believe in is AI will help us make us better framers, help us challenge our representation, say, oh, look, this is working. You didn't think it was working. But then it's going to be on us to go and say, okay, what does it challenge in our way of thinking about the world? And we can use that. I like the analogy with the macroscope. The macroscope just show you, or when Galileo look at the moon, look, there are things on the moon. We never thought about that. That challenges our representation on earth. So I think AI will play that role. I hope it will. Yes. And yeah. At least that, that's something I, I think everyone will take out of the book. The book sort of ends up with a, fairly optimistic note in the sense that uh, the book is also claiming that framing is our best bet in order to meet all the big challenges we are facing right now. I think so, yeah. What makes you optimistic that the ability of 
for humankind to become better in framing? Mm-hmm. Will be fast enough? I mean, that I don't in, know. In, in the frame that, <laughs> that we're in right now, that, and considering that is, framing has brought yeah. us bad framing, and has, 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 has brought us, that, in many know, senses, in the messes we are right now. It's more faith than anything here. But what I know is that what help us as a species, for good and world, what make us progress again and again, behind all those technology that we are talking, always, always, you will find an act of reframing. We, you will find the, the true progress we, we experience is because we change our representation of the world and things still exist. And the, the optimism comes from the fact that, yes, you can bait on AI. Yes, they have those amazing technology, but if you do not forget these, these deep abilities and if collectively we nurture it, then my hope is that collectively we can create new representations that will help us solve some of our major problems. Many thanks to all of you here in the room. Many thanks to all of you in the live streams. I think we've <laughs> framed the framer. Thanks. <laughs> thanks to your ample and intelligent questions. Um, well, let me end on the note that we all love and have become accustomed to hybrid um, uh, uh, events now, having people in the live stream having many of you in the room. One of the big advantages of being in a room is that after the event, there's an after event. In this case, is having a few drinks together, having a few snacks together. You all invited to join us uh, right, right here. We thank, thank you, Francis, Thanks, very, Annie. very much for this. Happy to take yes. some of the questions that we're not asked. Uh, no, 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 don't for, <laughs> yes, 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 you can, but, but we, I think we should right, Thanks, right now sure. really thank fo- you. focus on, on all these powerful uh, insights you, you, you gave Thomas. us. Uh, all of you here, welcome to join us. All of you on the live st- in the live stream, we thank you very, very much for your attention. Thanks and see you soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.